In this presentation, we will look at some principles of the gospel coming from the book of Acts, chapter 6 through 9. I would encourage you to read that before listening to this so that you'll know some of the details in the storyline of what's going on. So first of all, let's start out with Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Stephen chosen to see to temporal affairs. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, God commanded to his people in every age is, organize yourself. Moses chose 70 men to aid him in judging and regulating Israel. Here the ancient apostles selected seven brethren to aid them in administering the affairs of whatever system of united order was then in operation. The work assigned them fell within the realm of those temporal matters normally handled by the Aaronic priesthood, thus leaving the apostles free to handle the more difficult matters of their Melchizedek ministry. So here we see the organization of the church working, as some are called to just take care of temporal affairs so others may be permitted to just take care of spiritual affairs. Hiram M. Smith and Jane M. Sodal said the following, it is the special calling of a bishop to manage the temporal affairs of the kingdom of God. When in the church in Jerusalem, the impartiality of the distribution of the funds of the saints was questioned, the apostles moved that seven men be appointed to take charge. This was done. These seven men were bishops in the true meaning of the word overseer, not deacons, as generally supposed. So a bishop's main calling is to look over the temporal affairs of the ward, but also as the father of the ward looks after their spiritual items too. Let's go to Acts 6, verses 8 through 15. Stephen transfigured before the Sanhedrin. Preaching miracles and mighty displays of divine favor were not limited to the apostles. Stephen called to do more than serve tables, stepped forth as a mighty preacher of righteousness and a worker of signs and wonders. But miracles alone do not convert. Though the council knew of the miracles and saw Stephen's face shone with transfiguring radiance, Yet, spiritual, yet spiritually diseased as they were, they rejected his spirit-born witness of Christ and of salvation. How true is our Lord's declaration, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be pers persuaded, though one rose from the dead. We learn in the Doctrine and Covenants that signs and miracles are for those who already have faith to strengthen that faith, not to give someone faith. To show how hard-hearted the Jewish leaders were, Stephen was transfigured before them, visible witness thus being given that God was with him. In a lesser degree, it was with Stephen as it had been with Moses. The skin of his face shone visibly after he had communed with the Lord for 40 days on the mountain. So even though there's this physical manifestation that Stephen was under the influence of the Spirit and the Holy Ghost, the hard-hearted Jewish leaders would not listen or even pay attention to that again. Miracles are not to get faith. Miracles are to help strengthen those who already have faith. Acts 6, 11, verse 11, and then 13, 14, Stephen is accused of blasphemy against God and the temple. 
Jesus had prophesied the complete destruction of their temple. That's Matthew 24, 1 through 2. He had come to change not only the customs given by Moses, but to fulfill and transcend the whole law revealed through him. And in so teaching, Stephen was but echoing the precepts of the Lord. The false witnesses thus were guilty because they twisted, rested, and perverted Stephen's teachings, a practice common among those who opposed true and revealed religion. The Jews at the time of Christ, and especially the Jewish leaders of the Pharisees and Sadducees, making up what's called the Sanhedrin, did not pay attention to the miracles because of their lack of faith and because they did not believe in the Savior and the Holy Ghost in the gospel they had changed the gospel into a bunch of traditions. They had changed the law of Moses into a program that you follow instead of using the law of Moses to point to Christ. We are guilty today in the church of doing the same thing. We can go and live the gospel, but not ever let it point us to Christ but we just go through kind of like a checklist and almost like tradition we do things instead of because we're influenced by the Holy Ghost. As Nephi prophesied, the guilty will always take the truth to be hard for it cutteth them to the very center. As Nephi prophesied, the guilty will alone. Thus, they must repent or fight against it. Either we accept the truth and follow its precepts and submit ourselves willingly unto Christ and his doctrine, or the other only choice we have is to fight against it. There really is no neutral ground. Let's go to Acts chapter 7, Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin. As he was hauled before the Sanhedrin, as I said, on charges of blasphemy. And he gives a history lesson as his defense of why he has not blasphemed. Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin is a masterful one. He is charged with speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God, against this holy place, the temple, and against the law. His reply, I have spoken the truth. The whole history of Israel points towards the coming of Christ. Of Christ. Moses and all the prophets foretold his mortal ministry and divine sonship. But you unbelieving scribes and rulers are following in the footsteps of your rebellious fathers who rejected the word of God which came in their day. See, if we turn the gospel just into the social, traditional things that we do in the church and do not use it to come into Christ, then we too will fight against those changes that God's anointed make in the church. They had turned the law of Moses into God itself, that if you kept the law of Moses, you'd be saved. Well, nobody could keep the law of Moses completely because we're all sinners, we're all fallen. And so they had made the mistake of making the law of Moses and that that would bring salvation instead of using it to point their souls to Christ. How about us in the gospel? Are we using the different things, the sacrament, the temple, the programs, all of those things to point our hearts to Christ? Or are we just doing them because it's a program in the church? 
Just as ancient Israel apostatized against Moses and Jehovah, so too were the Jewish leaders at the time of Christ and the apostles in a state of apostasy. And going along with this, number one, we see Acts 7, verses 1 through 19. Stephen recounts the history of Abraham that Jehovah gave him the covenant of circumcision, the begetting of Isaac Jacob and his twelve sons. That should be sons, sorry for the misspell. And how Joseph was sold and taken to Egypt and became second in command to Pharaoh which enabled all of the family of Jacob to come to Egypt. However, they eventually came into bondage in Egypt. So this is Stephen, his defense, now retelling history of what has happened in the house of Israel. Number two, Acts 7, 20-36. Moses is born and brought up by the daughter of Pharaoh and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses defends one of the Hebrew slaves of Egypt and smote an Egyptian, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Because of his defending a Hebrew slave, Moses now flees to Midian, where he is visited by Jehovah, at the burning bush and given the assignment to go back to Egypt to free the Israelites from bondage. Could you imagine after them saying, well, who do you think you are? Do you think you're a prophet of God that you were sent to save us? And now he's got to go back to these people that are in a state of apostasy and in not believing in the true word of God that one, like Moses, would be raised up to save them. Number three, Acts 7, 37 through 43. Moses is a type of Christ, as Stephen testifies. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up, and unto you, your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. There will be another prophet like me who is greater, though. And he's referring to Christ. To whom Israel would not obey, and in their hearts turn back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for, as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. This is when Moses has gone up into the mount and he's there 40 days. And how quickly the Israelites turn to idol worship and convince Aaron to make them a golden calf to worship Jehovah. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Here they have been freed from Egypt miraculously and how quickly they turned to idol worship. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven and it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, ye have offered to me slain beasts and sacrifice for the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tower of Moloch and the star of your god, Rephan, figures which ye, which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away from Babylon. 
And so he recounts that how they had apostatized and turned to worshiping Molech, which was the god of sacrifice of little children, and how they had turned to worshiping the stars in the heavens and unto pagan worship even though God had freed them in the wilderness. And so Stephen is showing them how quick Israel was to turn to idol worship. Number four, Acts 7, 44 through 50. Even though Moses had made the true tabernacle and later Solomon made the temple, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as, the, as saith the prophet, meaning... The great creator by whom all things dwelleth not in temples made by the hands of his creatures, but he is worshipped by them in their temples, which holy houses he visits occasionally, and in which sacred spot his spirit may be always found may always be found by the faithful. Number five. Acts 7, verses 51 through 53. Stephen then proceeds to chastise them that the Jewish leaders were stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ear. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. You are just like your fathers in the wilderness and have turned your hearts against the just one, against the great Jehovah and his gospel. Number six, Acts 7, 50, 54. The leaders were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth, which was a figurative expression meaning their attitude toward him and their assault upon him were as though they were wild beasts attacking with bared fangs. And so they're becoming, as Stephen points out, their apostasy and how they have left the gospel just like their forefathers. He sees the anguish that now, I'm sorry, the anger that now proceeds from those who take the truth to be hard. Number seven, Acts 7, 55 through 60. Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, declares that he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God which caused the leaders to become even more enraged that they took him out of the city and stoned him to death. They just could not accept that someone could be righteous enough to see a vision of the Savior and the Father. And here they are, the Jewish leaders. Nothing like that has happened to them and they're the leaders over the Jews. Who's this Stephen? Who does he think he is? And so they take him out to stone him. Today, we see similar actions amongst the apostates who figuratively stone the prophets today by their words of falsehood, anger, and the resting of scriptures mixed with the philosophies of men. Unfortunately today, there are those who still fight against the Lord's chosen. As Elder Maxwell said, they are able to leave the church, but they can't seem to leave it alone. They must fight against it. I'm assuming so that they can rationalize their behavior of apostasy. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 now, verses 1 through 13. Philip works miracles and converts Simon. Philip, saintly, valiant, and powerful preacher, a mighty worker of miracles, held only the Aaronic priesthood. 
Peter and John must yet come from Jerusalem to Samaria to confer the Holy Ghost upon his baptized converts. And yet Philip, magnifying his casting, his calling, casts out devils, commands the lame to walk, and the sick to rise from their beds of afflictions. Miracles are wrought by the power of faith. And a righteous man need not hold the Melchizedek priesthood to have power and influence with his creator. As Joseph Smith said, if a priest understands his duty, his calling and ministry, and preaches by the Holy Ghost, his enjoyment is as great as it were one of the presidency. So it is the power of faith that miracles are wrought. Miracles of themselves do not convert men to the truth. The Jews were witnesses, witnesses of Jesus' mighty works, and yet they chose to remain outside the pale of his saving grace. But miracles may so impress the sincere investigator as to cause him to take the steps that lead to faith. Like it says in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's either section 64 or 63, miracles are for those who already have faith. There are plenty of people out there today that have faith in Jesus Christ who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But because of their faith, mighty works and miracles can be done, especially in helping them coming unto Christ. Signs flow from faith. They may incidentally have the effect of strengthening the faith of those who already are already inclined. But their chief purpose is not to convert people to the truth, but to reward and bless those already converted. Faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe, the Lord says. Yea, signs come by faith, not by the will of men, nor as they please, but by the will of God. Yet signs come by faith, doing mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God. And with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. Wherefore, unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. So it is, Doctrine and Covenants, section 63, verses 9 through 11. Signs are not given to help convert. Some may convert because of certain signs, and if that's the only thing that has changed them, and they don't nourish their faith, then they will eventually leave and apostatize from the truth. Faith that is based on signs alone is weak and ineffective. It usually demands added and greater signs to keep it alive, and those relying on such visible supernatural guidance soon begin to be less and less astonished at a sign and a wonder from heaven until they are in danger of disbelieving all they have heard and seen. Thus, belief based on supernatural experiences is less to be desired than that which stands on its own feet. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The power, brothers and sisters, comes in getting a witness from the Holy Ghost. That is one of his functions, is to burn doubt out of our hearts and burn belief into our souls. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24. Is my heart right in the sight of God? As Philip preached in Samaria, came across a man named Simon, who used sorcery to make himself out as a great person. Sorcery is the use of power gained from the assistance or control of evil spirits, 
which is called sorcery. Frequently, this power is used in divination, necro necromancy, and witchcraft. In effect, a sorcerer who works in effect, a sorcerer worships Satan rather than God and uses such power as Satan can give him in a vain attempt to imitate the power of God. And so this seems to be the actions of this Simon, of being deceived by God and thinking he's doing the works of God and miracles, but actually it is from the source of Satan. Sorcery has been a sinful evil in all ages. It was present in the courts of Pharaoh, Exodus 7.11, and of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 2.2. 2. Israel's prophets invade against it, Isaiah 47.57.3 and Jeremiah 27.9. Apostate Nephites reveal... Re, reveled in its mysteries, reveled in its mysteries. Peter and John fought its evils in their ministry, and its power is prevailing with great success over much of the earth today. So we have many today who claim supernatural powers or gifts that are false and not from God. And we must be careful of those individuals who claim secret certain knowledge or blessings or things about the church that only they know, even the apostles don't know, that God has revealed to them. That would be false prophets. Simon, hearing the preaching of Philip, believes his teachings and is baptized. However, when he saw how the Holy Ghost was given by the laying on of hands by Peter and John, Simon sought to gain this power by offering Peter money, which Peter rebuked Simon, saying, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this, thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And so Simon getting baptized was probably not truly converted, but saw good in what the church was doing. But in his heart, he desired fame, popularity, power, prestige. And when he saw that Peter had that, that he could purchase that, is our hearts right in the sight of God? Do I do things for the right reason? Is my heart right? Or do I have ulterior motives for why I do the things that I do? Our thoughts will reward or condemn us the, before the judgment bar. The righteous and the wicked are divided by their thoughts. Righteous thoughts lead to salvation, wicked thoughts to damnation. You can see the progression here. Our thoughts will control our behavior. Our behavior will then determine what type of kingdom we are able to bear in the next life. We must learn to control our thoughts. Alma 41 verse 11 says, All men that are in a state of nature, or I would say in a carnal state, are in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. They are without God in the world. They have gone contrary to the nature of God. Therefore, they are in a state contrary to the nature of true happiness. 
this would be the state that Simon was in, even though he was baptized and had somewhat of some kind of testimony or doing it out of recognition and wanting to be recognized, but he was in a carnal state, a fallen nature state that can only be overcome through the atonement of Christ. Acts 9, verses 1 through 9, the conversion of Saul. Number one, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. Verse 2, who desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any on this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So Saul is looking for Christians to take and to take to court and to be chastised and to be found guilty of blasphemy, which the punishment would be capital punishment. Verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now that's a darn good question, isn't it? Why do we sometimes persecute the Savior by the way we treat others? A sign of true conversion, brothers and sisters, will be in our treatment of other people. Verse 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 6, And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So here we are seeing Saul having to choose between his own conceit or faith in Christ. Lord, what will you have me to? What a very humble statement as he is being chastised by the Savior. How about when you and I are chastised by leaders of the church? What is our response? To become bitter? To get offended? To leave the church? Or to ask, what will thou have me do? Now, his faith is going to be seen in whether he arises and goes into the city as the angel said, or as Jehovah said. Faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it done. And so we're going to see if Paul is truly converted, not because of the miraculous event, but because he will now do what the Lord wants, when the Lord wants it, and how he wants it done. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And there for three days without and he was the, three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. What is my reaction to receiving chastisement? Saul's faith is exhibited in that he follows Jehovah's word and goes into the city where he will be miraculously occurred, I mean miraculously cured because of his faith in Christ, not because of the sign that he saw, but because he did the will of God. Joseph Smith gives us a description of Paul, who Saul changed his name to Paul. He said he is about five feet. He he is about five feet, very dark, dark, very dark hair, dark complexion, dark skin, large Roman nose, sharp face, small black eyes, penetrating as eternity, 
round shoulders, a whiny voice except when elevated, and then is almost resembling the roaring of a lion. He was a good orator, active and diligent, always employing himself in doing good to his fellow man. There's only one way I can think of how Joseph knows that much detail about Paul. It's because Joseph has probably seen and conversed with Paul. Acts 9, chapters 10 through 18, the acceptance of Saul. Verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And he said unto and to him, saith the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Verse 11, the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. So during those three days that he was blinded, he sees within his mind a vision of Ananias coming to heal him. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard how many of this man how much evil hath he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So Ananias is concerned, really? He's converted? You want me to help him? He has done so much danger and brought assault upon the saints in Jerusalem. Are we able to let people convert brothers and sisters? who may at one time done grievous things, as now Ananias is faced with the choice of having to help a man who has been so contrary to Christianity and has caused so much heartache. Verse 14, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name, he has bound up Christians and hauled them off into prisons. He has converted? Are you sure? Verse 4, 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer, for my name's sake. Verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. What faith Ananias has as he trusts the Lord that this man has changed, his heart has changed, even though he has done some very wicked things against those who are believers in Christ. Verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, arose, and was baptized. Brothers and sisters, How we see the meekness of Ananias in trusting in God in accepting the conversion of Saul, who had persecuted many saints and caused much havoc. Do we today in the church accept all who come into our chapels, even if they smell of smoke? Maybe they have a smoking problem. Do I still sit next to them or do I shy away? And sit away from them because think, oh, what a sinner. What's he doing here? He has a word of wisdom problem. Or they have shady reputations or have belittled others in the past. Are we as faithful as Ananias that if there are those who we don't think should be in the church, 
have a mighty change of heart and come in and do we fellowship them into the church? Or do we shy away from them and condemn them because of past actions? Well, that is something we have to decide. Do we have the faith that anyone can be converted to Christ if they turn their hearts to him and put their faith in him? And are we willing to accept anyone into the church who's willing to do that? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.